This woman was about to lose her life by hanging when she said something in her last words that shocked everyone. What she said could change everything the world knew. Welcome to African Tales by Picktales HD. Do not forget to subscribe and activate the bell button. If you don't, I'm afraid you might not see us again. Now go to the story. Amaka, a woman in her prime, found herself in a place where hope seemed as distant as freedom. Locked in the depths of solitary confinement, she was the focus of a trial that had captured the attention of the entire city. Accused of kidnapping and murdering Bella, the daughter of a famous judge in Nigeria named Chakwemeka, who had been missing for five years, the woman faced not only the possibility of a death sentence, but also the relentless judgment of public opinion. The media coverage was relentless, painting her as a monster even before her trial was over. The people of the city, thirsting for justice for little Bella, saw Amaka as the embodiment of all their fears and hatreds, with no room for doubt or compassion. However, despite the public outcry for her conviction, the detainee remained strangely calm, like an enigma that not even her lawyer could unravel. Why don't you say anything? Why don't you defend yourself? We could negotiate a deal if you cooperate. Her lawyer was perplexed, unable to understand his client's obstinate silence. It doesn't matter what I say, they've already made their choice. Amaka replied calmly, her eyes lost in a distant point on the wall of her cold cell. Her voice, although firm, carried the weight of years of suffering, a burden she bore alone. Imprisoned, the 32-year-old woman lived her days with a deep sadness, but also with a dignity that defied her desperate situation. Despite being on the brink of execution, she refused to let fear and hopelessness overwhelm her, standing firm in the belief that the truth was the only faithful companion she had left. On the eve of her execution, a visit from a priest offered Amaka the chance to make her last confession, a ritual for many in her situation, but for her, just another reminder of her imminent fate. Would you like to confess, child? There is nothing I can say that will change my fate, father. The truth will die with me. She said, her voice tinged with sadness. As night fell over the prison, Amaka spent the last hours before her cruel fate in deep reflection. She thought about her mistakes, about the choices that had led her to that fateful moment, on a journey that only she knew in its entirety. The walls of her solitary confinement, silent witnesses to her anguish, seemed to close in around her, like a dark omen to the approaching end. Yeah, I think this is the end. She sighed, and so she faced the dawn of her last day, a woman condemned not only by the law, but also by the incomprehension and fear of an entire city, preparing to face her fate with the same enigmatic serenity that had accompanied her throughout the trial. So you can better understand why she was being sentenced to death. It all happened five years ago. Amaka's case shocked the city and paralyzed the country as she was convicted of the terrible charge of kidnapping and murdering the judge's daughter. Her story was a complex web of forbidden love, revenge, and twisted justice. She had accused Judge Chukwemeka of having an affair with her, an allegation he vehemently denied, and which put his reputation in jeopardy. However, Things took a tragic turn one fateful day when the judge's wife was returning home with Bella, their three-year-old daughter, and Amaka caused an accident that resulted in the death of the wife and the subsequent kidnapping of the child. The city of Abuja cried out for justice, fueled by a collective rage against the criminal they believed was responsible for the tragedy. Captured in her own home, the woman faced a trial where all the evidence seemed to point against her. Despite her fervent denials, the conviction of her guilt was unshakable. Convicted, she was sent to prison, where she spent the next five years in solitary, an additional punishment imposed by Judge Chakwemeka himself to isolate her completely, preventing any form of empathy or understanding that might arise from interactions with other inmates. 
Amaka's life in prison was marked by loneliness and despair, a dark reflection of her sealed fate. Over time, she began to accept the end that awaited her, with a resignation born not of peace, but of the exhaustion of fighting a seemingly inevitable fate. It was then, on the eve of her execution, hours after the priest had visited her, that an unexpected encounter brought new torment to her already bleak reality. Chakuemika, the man who had been the epicenter of her misfortune, visited her in her cell, and after she had angrily hurled a million insults at him, he, with a vengeful smile, simply said, I hope you rot in hell just like Bella. He exclaimed, his words filled with a hatred that seemed to consume him. Amaka recoiled immediately, stunned by the venom in his words, and for a second, she was paralyzed, only able to watch as he walked away, leaving her with the cruel promise that he would see her for the last time the next day. That meeting left the woman even more isolated in her pain, as a reminder that, in addition to her imminent execution, the real torture was the unwavering hatred of those who condemned her without seeking to understand the complexity of her story. The next day arrived, and the woman hadn't been able to sleep. The night had been a long vigil of despair, each minute dragging by with the heaviness of her sentence and with the judge's visit. Just like Bella. And after much reflection, on that fateful morning, the reality of her destiny imposed itself with devastating force on her heart. As soon as the guards came for her, her survival instinct made her scream, denying the inevitable, crying out for justice in a world that seemed to have forgotten its meaning. No, no, he's lying. You have to continue with the case. She shouted, but her words were drowned out by her sentence. The guards dragged her into the execution room, and within a minute, Amaka found herself surrounded by gazes full of anticipation, witnesses, thirsting for justice, or perhaps just the final spectacle of a tragedy filled the small space. You're finally going to pay for your crimes, you murderer! Some murmured, as her head was forced into the hanging rope, her despair growing as the reality of her imminent end approached. The tension filled the room, a mixture of anticipation and horror, as they prepared the woman for execution. She could feel the weight of every gaze fixed on her, each one echoing the judgment that had condemned her. And when everything was ready, in the midst of this whirlwind of emotions, the guard in charge of the execution approached with a question that carried the weight of a final farewell. Do you want to say your last words? Yes, I do. Amaka managed to say, her voice firm despite the fear that consumed her. It was then that she noticed, even in her state of agony, a satisfied smile on the judge's face, who was sitting in the audience, watching everything. An expression that gave her an unexpected strength to reveal a truth she had kept hidden for so long. If you execute me now, I will take with me the truth about the kidnapping of little Bella. I know where she is because I'm her mother. She's alive, and I can prove it. Get that asshole's cell phone. She declared, her voice gaining strength with every word. The room plunged into shocked silence, and everyone turned to Chuck Wemica. Her lawyers immediately asked for the execution to be stopped. And so she was paralyzed by the magnitude of her revelation. The judge, trying to maintain his versage of authority, quickly tried to discredit her. That woman is crazy. Hang her now. He ordered angrily, but the convict didn't let herself be silenced. Do you deny that she is on your grandparents' farm? She challenged him, making the man swallow his fear, his mask of confidence finally falling. He once again accused her of being crazy and got up to leave. However, the detectives present, acting with a new urgency in the face of the shocking turn of events, intervened. Please, sir, we need you to sit down and give us your cell phone. One of the officers said, facing Chakuemika's fury. Do you know who you're talking to? I could have you arrested. He retorted, but his defensiveness only served to arouse more suspicion. 
While Amaka had her neck removed from the rope and the judge was detained for questioning, the world outside began to absorb the impact of the news. The press, in a frenzy, covered every development and the case that seemed closed opened up again, full of possibilities and questions. With the execution canceled, Amaka became the center of global attention, with everyone eager to understand the reasons behind this unprecedented decision. In the interrogation room, the air was tense, charged with the gravity of the revelations that had just come to light. The convict, in custody, finally had the opportunity to tell her story. A narrative of forbidden love, betrayal, and a desperate search for the truth, totally different from what was presented to the people by the judge. The woman explained in a firm voice that little Bella was the fruit of a secret relationship she was having with Chuck Wemeka, a married man who had promised to leave his infertile wife to be with Amaka and their daughter. However, frightened by the possibility of a scandal, he took the decision to disappear with the baby and his wife, claiming to have adopted Bella to fill the void left by their inability to have children of their own. The judge listened to this and retorted, Do you think I would kill my own wife and daughter to incriminate you? He said, laughing sarcastically during the interrogation. That's absurd! She's crazy! I demand to be released now! He shouted, his arrogant posture not hiding the tremor of fear at the possibility of being unmasked. Bella's true location remained a mystery until Amaka found out. It only took one slip for her to realize how much he had framed her. The inmate revealed a crucial detail, a memory of her time with the man who became the key to unraveling the girl's whereabouts. When we were having an affair, we went to visit his grandparents because his grandmother was sick. He introduced me as his assistant, and we spent three days on that farm. It's a very isolated place. They hardly go into town because they have everything there. I was delighted with the calm of the farm and the sunsets, but Orlando hated the place. He called it hell. The judge's words on the eve of the execution, wishing that Amaka would rot in hell just like Bella, suddenly made sense. The woman had connected the dots, realizing that the man had inadvertently revealed her daughter's hiding place. The judge tried to dismiss the accusation, insisting that Bella's grandparents had died years ago and that Lee's allegations were nothing more than the inventions of a disturbed mind. However, the determination in the woman's voice and the irrefutable logic of her argument raised enough doubts for the authorities to decide to investigate. Just go there and you'll see. And don't let him call anyone or he'll have Bella taken away. The prisoner warned, full of urgency. The chief of police, now faced with the possibility of a twist in the case, ordered the judge to stay put while a team of officers was sent to check the farm. The press, eager for every development, was in a frenzy at the unexpected turn of events. The world stood still, eager to understand whether a mockish shocking claim about Bella's location and well-being would prove it true. The investigation that unfolded over the next few days was more surprising and revealing than anyone could have imagined. Keeping Chuck Wemeka under strict surveillance at the police station to avoid any attempt at interference, the authorities followed the coordinates provided by Amaka to a remote farm where the truth was waiting to be discovered. When they arrived at the indicated location, they found not only Isabella, now eight years old, but also an elderly couple who turned out to be the child's paternal great-grandparents. They told the police everything. They said that their grandson, Chuck Wemeka, had come to them five years ago, bringing Bella, a small three-year-old baby, on the pretext that the girl was in danger. He had instructed the grandparents to raise Isabella in secret, claiming that her safety depended on absolute secrecy. If anyone finds out she's here, they will hurt her said the judge. The discovery of this web of lies and corruption shocked the public and triggered a wave of national indignation. The judge, once respected and considered a pillar of justice, was arrested and, after a speedy trial, 
sentenced to 30 years in prison for kidnapping, obstruction of justice, and a series of other crimes related to his desperate attempt to frame Amaka and hide his own nefarious deeds. The investigations revealed that he had taken advantage of his wife's tragic death in an accident, which happened while he was driving and swerved away from an animal on the road, hitting a tree to orchestrate Bella's disappearance, manipulating the evidence to point to his mistress as the culprit. His macabre plan was not only to get rid of the woman who threatened to expose his extramarital affair, but also to create a new life for himself, free from the complications of his past. When Amako was finally acquitted of all charges, her release was greeted with applause and tears of relief from the public who had once asked for her conviction. People were shouting, Please forgive us! Begging for her forgiveness. Her story, now revealed in all its complexity and tragedy, dominated the headlines, painting her not as the villain many believed her to be, but as a victim of one of the most terrible injustices ever seen. I just want my daughter back. She told journalists, tears of pain streaming down her face. Despite the legal victory and the vindication of her name, the pain of her forced separation from Bella still haunted her. Now, with the truth brought to light, Amaka faced the emotional challenge of rebuilding her relationship with her daughter, a healing journey they would both have to go through together. After a few weeks, mother and daughter were finally reunited after years of forced separation and suffering. Both began to weave the threads of a new life together. The little girl, now eight, learned the whole truth about her story, a tale of courage, unconditional love, and her mother's tireless fight to have her back. Unlike what Amaka thought, the little girl looked at her not just as her mother, but as a heroine who never gave up on her, even in the face of the cruelest adversity. With the compensation they received for the mistake of justice, they moved to a small house in the countryside, a peaceful refuge away from the stairs and suffering that marked their lives in the city. That house, surrounded by the vibrant green of nature and the singing of birds, represented the fresh start they both longed for, a place where Bella could grow and flourish away from the shadows of her tumultuous past. But they weren't alone on this new journey. The girl's great-grandparents, the elderly couple who raised her with all their love and dedication, were invited to join them. The decision to live as a united family was a natural one. After all, they were the ones who raised the girl with all the love she needed. What matters now is that we're together, and nothing will ever separate us again, said Amaka, hugging her daughter tightly as they both gazed at the golden horizon of the setting sun. It was a moment of pure happiness, a symbol of her victory against all the terror she had experienced and which had tried to separate them. So, Surrounded by the unconditional love of the old couple and the serene beauty of the farm, mother and daughter rebuilt their lives. Together, they overcame the scars of the past and looked to the future with optimism and joy. The story of Amaka and Bella, marked by pain and injustice, became a narrative of hope, redemption, and the indomitable power of family love. And as the sun set, painting the sky orange and pink, the woman, who had once been an inmate condemned to death, whispered a prayer of gratitude to the heavens for the gift they had been given. The chance to start again, to write new chapters of their lives, as it should always have been. A family united against all odds, ready to face whatever the future held, with hearts full of love and hope. And if you liked this story, I'm sure the next video that pops up on your screen will move you too. If you don't subscribe to my YouTube channel, I'm afraid you might not see me again. So hit the subscribe button now for more interesting stories. Thank you.